These are interesting times in the life of our church. You know, so much of what we do is what we always do, and yet uh, it's all different. Nothing is the same. Uh, If you are a member of Southside Baptist Church, you know this time of year is one of those times that we've set aside and we look at who we are as a church and we prayerfully consider who we want to help lead us in the coming year. Now, we have two groups of leaders in our church that are so critical to our mission. One is a group of deacons. These are servant leaders who work within our small groups to provide care and guidance for our members. This is such an important role in our church. And you nominate and elect people that you recognize fill those biblical qualities. And we hope that you will take some time during this season, like we've always done, to consider who might fulfill those roles. We also have another group that we call trustees. This is a small group of nine people. We elect three every year who serve a three-year term. These individuals help guide our church and protect our church. They look out for the well-being of our church and its day-to-day operations. Now, during this time of year, we always ask you to prayerfully nominate some of these folks to serve in the coming year. And this year, even though everything is different, that still hasn't changed. So we'd love, if you are a member of the church, for you to take a few minutes, go to ssbc.org tools. You can find a link there to a form where you can still nominate some folks. And we hope that you'll take some time to do just that. Now, to go along with this process that we're going to be involved in this month, we also want to take this time to talk about some of the core values that we have as a church. Because it's so important for us to understand who we are and where we're going when we're considering who we're asking to lead our church. So we're beginning a brand new series today that I'm calling Tightrope. This is a series that will focus on our core values, those unchanging things that we hold on to even when everything else around us is unclear and uncertain. You know, one of the speakers that I admire right now in the United States made this statement, and it really captured me. He said, when we lack certainty, we are desperate for clarity. Man, I find that to be so true for me. I know in our house with kids going to college and uh, senior in high school and just not even knowing when school was going to start or what form it was going to take, we did not have much certainty about anything. And in those times, it's really important that we're grounded in the things we do know for sure, the things that we can have clarity on. And I think that's true for us as a church. There's so much uncertainty around us right now. You've got the pandemic. You've got all the social unrest. You've got a very contentious presidential election looming on the horizon. And nobody knows for sure what's going to happen. But we can have clarity about some really important things. We know, first of all, that God's in control. We know that he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We know that Jesus is building his church. We know that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we know for certain that he has given us a mission that hasn't changed in spite of the changing circumstances all around us. And so during this series that we're calling Tightrope, we want to focus on these core values. And I have a few goals for us, things that I hope will be true for us as individuals, for our families, and for our church. First of all, I hope that you will gain a greater clarity during this season of so much uncertainty. Second, I am hoping that we will use this season to better align ourselves, better align our families, and better align our church with Jesus and his mission that hasn't changed. And finally, I am hoping that your faith will increase and that your fear will decrease and that when you look back on this season of your life, you will say that your faith grew like never before. So those are some pretty lofty goals So let's get into this series and talk about our core values in this series that we're calling Tightrope. Now, during this series, there is a small group conversation that's going on. So we would love for you to be involved in a small group that's also engaged in talking about our mission and our vision. But in our sermons, we're going to focus primarily on our core values, those five things that we know for certain, those unchanging values that guide us through all these times of uncertainty. Now, each of these core values has, has, uh, has two sides to it. it. It offers a tension that exists and that we have to hold these two things in tension and in balance if we're going to truly live out the value that we hold to. Now, when you talk about tension, there's a positive tension and there's negative tension. 
So when you think about negative tension, think about it in terms of tug of war. You have a rope and you're pulling on the rope in an effort to defeat your opponent. You want to use the tension to win the battle, ultimately to relieve the tension, hopefully with you on the winning side. But there's another way to think about tension, a positive tension. This is how you think about it in terms of a tightrope. When you have a tightrope, you need the tension on each side of that rope to be balanced in order for you to be able to walk the tightrope. This is the kind of tension that we're going to talk about when we talk about our values. Now, sometimes when you think about tension and you think about negative tension, think about, you can think about politics. What's going on in the country today? You've got conservatives, you've got liberals, you've got Democrats and Republicans, and they're pulling on each other in an effort to defeat the other. But that's not really how our country works best. Our country works best when people with different ideas and values hold those values in tension with one another and we're able to navigate those difficult times. It's also true of churches. There are churches and there are ideas, theological ideas and theological beliefs that are held in tension. Sometimes we get this idea that we have to defeat the opposite idea when in fact the the biblical model might be for us to hold those ideas and those values in tension. That's how I want us to look at these values that we're going to consider. So let's take a quick look at these values, and we're going to go through these one by one over the next few weeks. This week, we're going to be looking at this value that we are biblically grounded and gospel-centered. Those two things are held in tension. But then in subsequent weeks, we're going to look at the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. We're going to look at this idea of ministry and prayer. We're going to look at kingdom expansion through group multiplication. And we're going to look at this idea that we are diverse but we are united. So these are the five values that we'll cover over the next five weeks. And I hope you'll join us each week. And again, get involved in a small group in that discussion that's going on. It's such an important part of what we're doing. And if you want to see these values, these core values, check out our Pathways document. You can find it online at ssbc.org tools along with the resources for today's message. So let's get started. Let's look at this first core value. We are biblically grounded and gospel-centered, biblically grounded and gospel-centered. Now, this idea of being biblically grounded and gospel-centered is so important, and you hear that in your ears, and I know for me, I think, well, of course, we're biblically grounded, and of course, we believe in the Bible, but we don't often think about the tension that this has created. When these two things are not held in balance, we fall into one of two ditches on either side of this narrow road that we're called to live. So if you are biblically grounded, but you're not gospel-centered. In other words, you're out of balance towards being biblically grounded. The Bible becomes a weapon. We can become legalistic. We can become arbitrary in how we apply scripture. And most of all, we become hypocritical. But on the other hand, if we say, well, we're gospel-centered, but we're not necessarily holding that value in tension with being biblically grounded, we can become more like a self-help group It's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure Bible where we go through the Bible and cut and paste those verses that we like and that make us feel good and that are helpful and ignore the parts that don't necessarily help us. And we don't want to be either one of these things. We want to hold these two things in a healthy tension. We are biblically grounded and we are gospel-centered. Ultimately, if these things are out of balance, it leads many people to abandon the church and ultimately and sadly to abandon their faith in Jesus Christ. So let me look at each one of these things and let's talk about how it looks when they're out of balance. First of all, if you've got this cut and paste, choose your own adventure Bible, then then we focus this idea, well, it's all about the gospel. It's all about what Jesus said, only the teachings of Jesus, but then even then only the teachings of Jesus that we like and that make us feel good. This theology aligns more with self-help teachers. It looks a lot more like Oprah or, or Dr. Phil. Whatever makes me feel good, whatever makes me happy must be from God. We cut away all the parts that make us uncomfortable or that might create some tension inside of us. And all you need is love. Like we have practice of a, a Beatles theology as if all we need is love. But even then, it's only love as we get to define love. So we're left with a watered-down Jesus who can easily be replaced by just any good 
therapist that has a TV show or any good self-help book. And so we, we find ourselves in this difficult position where if we focus exclusively on the gospel message without being biblically grounded, we can become relativistic in our beliefs. We, become, we can become relativistic in our theology and in our ethics. So that's the ditch that we fall in if we just focus on the gospel and we're not biblically grounded. But there's another ditch we can fall in, and that's a ditch that says, hey, we're going to be biblically grounded. We're going to be committed to the word of God, but we're not really focused on being gospel-centered. Now, what this looks like is legalism. This is where somebody takes the Bible, and more importantly, their interpretation of the Bible, and they say, this is what must be true. And everything about what I believe about it must be true for any of it to be true. So if you've experienced this, you've gone to school or you've faced some situations in life where you had really difficult questions. Maybe they were science-based questions and people kept trying to give you faith-based answers from the Bible. Answers that the Bible doesn't really even address. Issues of, for example, like creation. Uh, Issues like, can a man really live in the belly of a fish for three days? Now, those are interesting conversations, interesting debates, and people of faith have different opinions about those. But when we're biblically grounded without being gospel-centered, everything we interpret, everything we believe becomes equally important, equally essential. So we take our interpretation of the Bible and we weaponize it. We use it to separate people, to decide who the winners and who the losers are. And so this is what happens when we aren't biblically grounded and gospel-centered. That we understand that we must hold these two in a healthy tension with one another. So how do we do that? How do we do it? First of all, I think we have to understand the origins of our Christian faith. We have to understand this, that the people who first followed Jesus, and really for hundreds of years after that, the people who followed Jesus didn't follow Jesus because the Bible told them so. They followed Jesus because there were witnesses, eyewitnesses who told them what happened. And then there were written accounts as they carefully recorded what they experienced with Jesus, what they heard Jesus say, what they saw, and they passed it from one generation to another to another. And so we believe and we put our faith in Jesus Christ because Matthew, a tax collector, an outcast, became a follower of Jesus, and he saw Jesus rise from the dead. And he wrote about it and passed it down. We believe Jesus. We follow Jesus because Luke, a Gentile, put his faith in Jesus, carefully researched and interviewed hundreds of eyewitnesses and wrote about it. And we have it in the Bible in the Gospel of Luke. We put our faith in Jesus Christ because a man named Paul, who was a Pharisee, who sought to destroy the church, didn't believe Jesus at all, had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus, did a 180 and became the greatest church planner the world had ever known. We believe because there was a man named James, who was a brother of Jesus, who never believed Jesus was the Messiah during his life. But after his death and his resurrection, and after James saw his brother alive, put his faith in Jesus, and became a leader of the church in Jerusalem. All of these people followed Jesus, not because the Bible told them so. They followed Jesus because they knew the truth of what happened in history. They hinged their faith on one thing only, and that is that this man who claimed to be God in flesh died on the cross and rose again. And he said, if we put our faith in him, that he can forgive us of our sins and ensure our place for eternity with God. And so we understand and know that as we are biblically grounded, we have to be gospel-centered. And we understand that because we're gospel-centered, everything we read and know about the Bible comes through our understanding of who Jesus is and what he taught. I'll give you a great example of this. So as Jesus was interacting with his disciples, there were often times he would cite the Old Testament, which would have been the Bible that they would have had in their day, the Old Testament, the prophets and the law. And he would say, you have heard it said, which was a reference to the scripture. But then he would say, but I tell you. Or you have seen that it is written, but I tell you this. Now, he wasn't contradicting what the Old Testament said. Instead, he was interpreting it. And he was teaching his followers that the best way, the only way, that you can rightfully interpret the Old Testament and all of the Bible is through the person who wrote its understanding of it and interpretation of it. And so Jesus taught and Jesus lived and everything that we understand about being biblically grounded 
is centered in the teachings and the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. So we have to hold these two things in a healthy tension with one another. Now I want us to look at a passage of scripture that I think demonstrates this for us in a very clear way. If you have a Bible, open with me to Mark chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. Let's take a look at this passage together as we consider how do we hold these two things in a healthy tension, biblically grounded and gospel-centered. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Now, this is a pretty amazing experience. I mean, here Jesus is with his three main disciples, and he takes them up on this mountain, and they experience this incredible thing where it's almost like the curtain is peeled back, and you see Jesus for who he is, God in flesh, in all his radiance and all his glory. And then something else amazing happened. Look at verse 4. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now, it's important to know that when we talk about Elijah and Moses, they represent something really important. Elijah is sort of one of those iconic prophets of the Old Testament. And so when you talk about Elijah, he really represents all the prophetic writings of the Old Testament. And when you talk about Moses, well, he's the one who gave the law. So you're talking about all the law. So all the law and the prophets are with Jesus on this mountain. That's what that represents. James and John, they're there and they're watching and they see this incredible thing happen. And with them suddenly is Elijah and Moses. All the law and the prophets are there. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Have you ever had a moment like that where uh, you didn't know what else to say and so you just blurted something out and then you almost wish you could take those words back? I'm sure that's how Peter felt in this minute. He said basically, hey, let's pitch a tent here. Let's pitch a tent for you guys. This, This is amazing. I mean, Jesus, we think you're pretty cool, but Moses is here and Elijah's here. Let's pitch a tent. Let's build an altar for this and let's mark down this moment. And then suddenly something even more incredible happens. So, so far, you've got Jesus revealing his glory. You've got Moses and Elijah showing up. But look what happens next. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. That is so important. God is telling Peter, basically, Peter, shut up and listen to Jesus. Listen to what he's about to say to you. And suddenly... Looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Now, this is really significant when we think about what it means in terms of the law and the prophets and how they relate to Jesus. In fact, there's another passage of scripture where this kind of comes up in Luke chapter 24. Now, in this particular passage of scripture, you have a couple disciples after the crucifixion walking away. They're going home. They're rejected. They're so discouraged. And the resurrected Jesus walks beside them on the road, and they don't realize that's who it is. And they have this interesting encounter. And I want you to listen to what Jesus says to them, Luke 24, verses 25 and 27. He said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. There's the prophets. And beginning with Moses, there it is the law, and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all all the scripture, the things concerning himself. Now that is an amazing passage because what it tells us is that Jesus used the Old Testament and said, hey guys, this is all pointing to the same truth. The prophets, the law, everything is pointing to me. And then if you consider this teaching that Jesus had, this encounter Jesus had with the Pharisees in John chapter 5, where they're really questioning who he is and who gave him the authority to say and do the things he did. And then he said this to them in John 5, 39. You search the scriptures. Now remember, these Pharisees wouldn't have only known the scriptures well. They would have had the entire book of the books of the law memorized. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Now that's a good reason to read the Bible. It's a good reason to be biblically grounded, right? You want to have eternal life. You want to know what it does to please God. But look what Jesus says next. And it is they that bear witness about me. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, 
you're searching the scriptures to find eternal life. That's good, but you're not going to find eternal life in the scriptures. You're going to find eternal life in the one the scriptures point you to, and the scriptures point you to me. That's where the scripture is pointing. So what Jesus is saying is, hey guys, you are biblically grounded, but you're not gospel-centered. You're not understanding what the point of all the scripture is. So let me just share with you a few ideas that I think we can take from this as we really consider this idea of living out this value in our lives, in our families, in our church, of being biblically grounded and gospel-centered. First of all this, we believe Jesus is the Bible's main character. That's so critical. It's only through him that we can understand what the Bible really means and what it says. That everything about the Bible is pointing to one thing, and that is the arrival, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and the ultimate return of Jesus Christ. It's what it's all about. So our interpretation of the Bible begins with Jesus. He is the main point. The main point isn't whether or not a man can really live in the belly of a fish for three days. That's not the point of Jonah. We've talked about that before. The point of creation isn't how God did it step by step and all the science involved in it. It's the fact that God breathed his spirit into man and gave us life. It's the fact that God was there in the beginning and with him was the word and, the, and God was there creating things. Jesus was involved with creation. All things were created in him and through him and for him. That's the point. So we only understand that, though, if we're biblically grounded and gospel-centered. The second thing is this. All Scripture is equally inspired, but not equally relevant. Now, I understand that this can be kind of a difficult thing to understand. And before you just turn me off or tune me out, let me just give me a chance to, to say what I mean. All Scripture is equally inspired. We believe that the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of God's word using unique authors and their unique styles, but all of it's inspired by God. But not everything in the Bible is equally relevant. Let me show you what I mean. Let's take a look at Romans 5.8, okay? Here's a verse. This is just an example. Romans 5.8 says this, But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now that verse is a really important verse. In fact, I would say it's an essential verse for us to understand the whole message of the Bible. That God's love for us was demonstrated in that Jesus came and even when we were at our worst, he died for us. There's nothing we can do to earn salvation. Jesus has done it all on our behalf. Very important verse. Now, just, just to show you what I mean, that all the Bible, we believe the whole Bible is equally inspired but not equally relevant, let's look at 1 Chronicles 5.8, okay? 1 Chronicles 5.8 says this, And Bela, the son of Azaz, son of Shema, son of Joel, who lived in Arar, as far as Nebo and baal Maon. What? I, I mean, is this inspired by the word of God? Yes. Does this have some significance? Absolutely it does. And if you're an Old Testament, uh, if you're an Old Testament scholar, this really helps you date things and understand things and verifies the truth of God's word. It is inspired, no doubt. But is this as equally relevant to our faith, essential to our salvation, as Romans 5:8? The answer has to be no. This is what it means to be biblically grounded but gospel-centered, that all scripture is equally inspired, but not equally relevant. Third, we value the Bible as God's authoritative word, meaning that we don't question this book as God's word. We know that it's got authority for us. We study it together. We seek to build our lives on it. We seek to build our church on its truth. The Bible is our standard, and it's our final authority for all issues of life, faith, and practice. We do admire, we, we, we hold up the Bible, we recommend the Bible. We say, if you want to know the best way to live, the happiest way to live, the way that will bring you the most peace and fulfillment now and throughout eternity, you can trust God's word as the authoritative source for everything having to do with faith and practice. And finally, we're biblically grounded and gospel-centered because we know that being biblically grounded saves us from cultural and moral relativism. It keeps us from falling into the ditch of just going with every shifting change of culture and every latest fad because we're biblically grounded. But also we know that being gospel-centered saves us from falling into the ditch of legalism and hypocrisy. 
That if we just instead just say, hey, we believe everything about the Bible, and not just that we believe it, but my interpretation is the only way to believe it. We, we, we veer into legalism, and ultimately it leads us to hypocrisy. This was the greatest criticism Jesus had for the religious leaders of his day. Being gospel-centered saves us from that. But we have to hold these two things in a healthy tension with one another. Biblically grounded and gospel-centered ministry means that we seek to engage the culture with the truth of God's word by demonstrating and proclaiming the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Both things are true. That God has called us to be holy as he is holy. But he also knows we can't do that. We all fail and fall short, and so he sent Jesus And on our behalf, that we find our holiness, we find our worth, we find our value in him, not in our acts of righteousness, but in his righteousness, biblically grounded and gospel-centered. So what do you do with this? Let me give you a couple ideas this week as you just contemplate this, as you think about this, as you try to apply it to your life. What does it mean for you to be biblically grounded and gospel-centered? First of all, let me challenge you to follow along with our daily reading plans, especially the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I believe that is the key to understanding the entire Bible. It is how we come to interpret everything from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. It's how we are biblically grounded and gospel-centered. The next thing I want you to do is encourage you to to check out this little test, okay? This little test. Where are you on this spectrum from biblically grounded to gospel-centered? We'll put it up here on the screen, but you can also find it in the notes. Somewhere in here, do you lean more towards being biblically grounded or do you lean more towards being gospel-centered or are you more balanced and somewhere in the middle? How can you know? Let me just ask you a couple questions and you can put your mark on the line where you think you fall. First question is this. Do you hold others and yourself to unattainable standards based on biblical commands and then use shame or feel shame when you don't meet those standards? If your answer to that is yes, then you probably lean towards the biblically grounded side. You're out of balance towards legalism. But here's the second question. Do you excuse sin without regard to its cost or its consequences? Not just its cost and consequences to you, but ultimately what it cost God in his son Jesus Christ. If you do not take sin seriously enough, then you may lean more towards moral relativism or this idea of, hey, we're just going to pick and choose based on the teachings of Jesus that we like. Ultimately, we want to live in balance between these two things. The writer of Hebrews said this, Hebrews 4, 12 and 13, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, it piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Now just think about this. What is that talking about? It's like a tightrope. It's like walking on a narrow road. That in one, in one way, if we become legalistic or, or we lean towards this idea of, hey, the Bible tells me so, and this is how I interpret it, and this is how I believe it, and that settles it. Then we veer into this sort of legalistic religious life, and we get cut by the grace and mercy of Jesus. We can't stand the idea that Jesus would just offer forgiveness and grace to people who don't deserve it, when the truth is, we don't deserve it either. But on the other hand, if we lean into this, moral, this idea of moral and ethical relativism, where everything is just what makes us feel good in the moment, we get cut by God's demand for holiness, by, for his demand, his call to live righteous, a righteous life, a righteous life that we can't live on our own, but we can only do in Jesus Christ. We have to hold these two things in tension. So what about you? Where are you? Now, if you are someone who is a Jesus follower, You may fall on this spectrum somewhere and you may need to take some time this week just to say, hey, how do I become more balanced, more biblically grounded and gospel-centered? But for some of you, maybe you've never placed your faith in Jesus. In fact, everything we've said about the Bible may be some of the reasons why you've resisted Jesus, that the Bible's been weaponized and used against you. And I would just say to you, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that somebody abused God's word and treated you that way. And I would encourage you, Read the writings and teachings of Jesus. Not because he lets us off the hook for all the things we've done wrong. It's better than that. Because Jesus forgives us for all those things. And that he paid the penalty for all those things through his death on the cross. 
and then God raised him from the dead. And because of that, we can have faith that God has forgiven us, that we will live a full and abundant life now and for eternity because of what Jesus has done for us. Wherever you find yourself on this journey, let me encourage you, wrestle with this idea of being biblically grounded and gospel-centered. If we can help you in any way in that process, please reach out to us. You can text us, you can call us, you can message us, you can leave a comment. We would love to follow up with you and just answer your questions about these. We know these are difficult things, and we know that in the face of all the uncertainty around us, the clarity that comes from this simple truth of being biblically grounded and gospel-centered will help us navigate not just our current challenges, but all of life. Let me invite you to pray with us. Father, I want to thank you for your word. Lord, not just the word on a page, but the word that was made flesh, that we could see your word live down in Jesus. We hear it in his teachings. We see it in his miracles. And God, because of what he taught us, because of the way he demonstrated your love, we can understand all of the Bible points us to one thing, and that is your love for us as demonstrated in Jesus, your desire to save us from the consequences of our brokenness and our sin. So God, help us to to live in the balance of those two things. The, The fact that our sin is great, but your grace is so much greater. The fact that there is a standard and an expectation that we can never attain, and yet through your grace and your love, through Jesus, Father, you see us as holy and righteous in him. Father, what a gift. And Lord, I pray for anyone listening today, whether they have veered off into a legalistic religion or, Father, whether they're suffering from the effects of moral relativism, God, I pray that today you will draw them back to that narrow road of faith. And Lord, that we would follow it as we follow after Jesus. Father, help us to apply this truth to our lives. Help us to apply it in the way we interact with our family and our friends. Help your church, help this church, Lord, not just to say we believe these things, but to actually practice it in all that we do. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you are our anchor in difficult times. You are the clarity we need in the face of all the uncertainty that is before us. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this privilege that we have to read your word together today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.